Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about simulation. Are we in a simulation? But before I go on, first, the qualia of the day is the red pill. Classic Wachowski metaphor. Are you going to take the red pill and figure out what the truth of the matter is? Or are you going to take the blue pill? Pretend that this was just a YouTube video. Nothing too spectacular going on in here. Just one of many of my, you know, antics. Who cares? Are you interested in taking the red pill? You know, most people say that they care about truth. They act in some circumstances as if they cared about truth. But the gestalt of their life, oftentimes, is really just the cultivation of pleasant illusions. So, are you going to be one of them? Or are you a truth seeker? It is up to you. I'll give you a few seconds to decide. <laughs> you can always just pause this video and close the tab. I see you're still here. Are you going to take the red pill? Yes? All right. I'll show you how far the rabbit hole goes. All right. So what did I just take? Something that can actually show you that you live in a simulation. You don't believe me? You will pretty soon. Dextrometorphin. Technically only 15 milligrams, so not really a substantial dose. <laughs> I don't expect to be robot tripping anytime soon. Probably threshold effects. Um, I don't know, I may become a little bit uh, sloppy uh, towards the end of the video, if we go that far. But yeah, dextrometorphin shows you that you live in a simulation. Indeed, if you take a sufficient amount combined with something like THC, as documented by Stephen Lehar and many other people uh, online, you can enter a state of consciousness that is called a free-willing hallucination, where you basically gain some degree of control over the parameters of your world simulation, essentially the contents of your consciousness. Now, I already made a video about <laughs> free willing hallucinations. Yeah, I didn't make it on DXM. <laughs> I, I wasn't on DXM at the time, um, but I, I did talk about it and, you know, to quite some depth. Uh, so I'm not gonna, you know, go in that rabbit hole today, but I will mention though that the simulation that your brain instantiates, which actually makes up everything in your consciousness, is much bigger than you actually think. Like, it's not just, you know, a few colors, you know, tactile sensations, maybe the ideas that you have, emotions. It actually goes a lot deeper. You know, it includes the horizon. It includes the sky. It includes your model of what's going on inside the planet. You know, what's going on at the nuclei of this planet. It includes galaxies. It includes basically your model of how physics work, how life works. All of that is going on in your inner world simulation. So it really isn't, you know, just a matter of processing sensory data. We're kind of like making sense of uh, the patterns of stimulation and kind of like generating like a surface level model. No, 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 no. Your world simulation is extraordinarily deep and it has many components, most of which you're not actually aware of. Um, either you're not aware of because they're unconscious or you're aware of, but you don't explicitly represent. They're not part of your conceptual scheme because they're implicit. One of them, for example, is this whole concept of amodal perception that, you know, I can take a box, but even when there are like occlusions in your world simulation, you're still including, in other words, yeah, basically, you're still including the part that is occluded. Um, and we, we can know that because of like all sorts of fascinating visual illusions that arise from that effect. Now, 
Um, importantly, the overall simulation also includes this thing that, you know, has many names. Some people call it the unconscious, some people call it the super ego, some people call it, uh, you know, in Buddhism, um, storehouse consciousness, some people call it the supra self meta programmer. But basically, your world simulation also includes a kind of impersonal force that tries to make sense of reality, including values, like what are the ultimate values. And, you know, the highest authority in your world simulation is that. It isn't your sense of self. It isn't your ego. It is your super self meta programmer, and you're at the mercy of it. In fact, the ego is just being spun in order to accomplish tasks that in one way or another move towards the gradient of the values that the super self meta programmer dictates. And, you know, on a high enough dose of a psychedelic substance, you can interact with those, you know, meta programs and more so you can modify them to some extent. So a lot of the particularly insane things that can happen on, you know, exotic states of consciousness involve to some extent like the renegotiation of your relationship with the super self meta programmer of your world simulation, which can oftentimes actually just manifest as, for example, talking to God or something like that. Now, there is this uh, yeah, fascinating book by John Lilly uh, that I recommend, Simulations of God. He basically talks about how, you know, the highest value that we have um, really kind of like is an important part of the furbishing of your, you know, internal world simulation. And uh, your conception of God, in some sense, is going to be kind of expressing that. So, you know, for some people, God is, you know, God as the beginning is like that which explains, you know, how it is, you know, all of this got started. <laughs> for some other people, you know, God is everybody. You know, we are all God, you know, kind of the open individualist perspective. Uh, but, you know, there's also God as orgasm, God as sex, you know, God as drugs, God as the body, God as money. You know, that's a big one. God as righteous wrath. You know, a lot of people buy into that God. <laughs> Seriously, it's bizarre. God as science. Truth be told, <laughs> that is, you know, a very big component of my God. God as science. Not in the sense of like, oh, let's worship, you know, whatever output comes out of academia or, you know, textbooks or something like that. Like, no, no, no. God as science <laughs> in the sense of being willing to take the red pill. <laughs> Sacrificing short-term the short-term comfort for the purpose of ontological accuracy. Yeah, so that's important. God as the computer. Mm, now we're getting into some interesting territory. God as consciousness without an object. You know, kind of these pure consciousness, Janic states of consciousness, or, you know, nirvanic states of consciousness. Yeah, you can also think of those as kind of your highest values. Uh, God as humor. You know, the, the, the cosmic joke and so on. Now, we'll get to that, but ultimately, you know, I think the true one God is actually <laughs> God as valence. But all right, you don't need to believe me for the time being. Um, but yes, so DXM can show you that you live in a simulation. It also shows you to some extent that it's likely a world simulation created by your nervous system. And if you modify the, you know, the signal transduction parameters of your nervous system, you can, yeah, modify the contents of your simulation. Now, there's also simulation in a, you know, very formal academic sense, you know, uh, Nick Bostrom has the simulation argument, which roughly says that, hey, like one of these three things has to be true, which is like either humanity or human, humanity-like civilizations almost always go extinct before they are able to actually produce, civiliz uh, you know, pr uh, produce simulations. B, um, you know, post-human civilizations don't tend to create uh, simulations, uh, even, you know, if they have, like, the capability of, of doing so. Or maybe, you know, in this version also, like, uh, maybe it's actually impossible, like, physically impossible to create, like, you know, full-on simulations uh, of universes. And then the third one is that we are almost certainly in a simulation. And, uh, you know, a lot of people actually consider this argument um, really compelling. I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's it's true that one of these three things have has to be the case. Um, a lot of people rule out the first and the second, and so like they consider it very likely that we're actually in a simulation. 
Uh, an interesting, you know, side effect of this is that because of the simulation argument, you have kind of this dual relationship where the smarter you are <laughs> and able to grasp also, you know, kind of like Aspie, you know, actually buying into these sort of arguments, you know, anyway, like if you're a systematizer and pretty smart, um, yeah, you know, you hear the simulation argument that's going to, you know, bump up the probability that you're in a simulation. Uh, but also if you have a very exciting and interesting life, for example, Elon Musk, you know, he actually talks about the simulation argument. And I suspect that Elon Musk probably assigns a significant, you know, like mass of his probability to being in a simulation. He even talks about it in, in Joe Rogan about, um, you know, he says things like, uh, you know, yeah, there's just going to be so many games like in Rick and Morty, like Roy, you know, like you live through an entire life and it really is just, you know, one, uh, you know, one penny that you you, <laughs> you, you put in that in that game. Uh, you know, you can produce like, you know, simulations of interesting people, you know, by the millions, perhaps with advanced technology. You, in, in that case, you know, that's kind of like a, a variant where you don't actually simulate everything all the way to, you know, kind of like quantum mechanics or anything like that. You just keep everything at a surface level. You just simulate the, you know, sensor inputs and, you know, maybe how you think and how you feel, you know, in some versions, that's also part of the, 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 the content of the simulation. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part in that view, uh, the reason why you're here is because you want some sort of like entertainment, you know, and in, in, in that sense, uh, uh, yeah, you just kind of like chose this character that is doing whatever you're doing. And you probably also chose an interesting time in history. Uh, and maybe, you know, something interesting to do with a lot of, you know, ontological uncertainties. And for people who believe in this, you know, they, they will generally also consider that, um, it's not a coincidence that it looks like we're at the verge of, you know, the technological singularity or something like that. That like this, this feeling that there's a very high causal power that you have, you know, if you play your cards right, you can drastically influence the far future. You know, that seems kind of like a feature, you know, it's kind of like, oh, exciting, like fun. Uh, that's, uh, that's something that I would like to, to play, you know? You don't want to play being, you know, a fish like 300 million years ago and be eaten by a predator <laughs> with like no interesting life whatsoever. Like, no, you want to be a evolved monkey that is about to transcend, you know? Okay, fine. You know, that's, that's a, that's a perspective. Now, um, it probably wouldn't have like that much of a gripping power if, you know, there weren't ways of actually experiencing these as like extremely compelling. And, you know, it actually turns out that DMT generates extremely compelling feelings of being in a simulation. You know, actually, people that I consider pretty sane, um, sometimes, yeah, they have like a DMT trip. And during the trip, they say, you know, I was 100% convinced at the time that this was a simulation. And more so, they showed me, they proved it to me. You know, they did some interesting, you know, perceptual effect or they showed me something about my life that like, I, you know, I never told anybody uh, or they, you know, showed me, you know, remote viewing information or something like that. It's usually not that. It's actually us usually something like there's like entities and they prove to you that they are like mind independent. That, that they're like, uh, they don't have your personality. They don't have your aesthetics, etc. You know, so it's kind of like really strange. It's very difficult to explain what is going on and you know, the, the way in which they manipulate your consciousness makes you feel that, yeah, that's not your brain doing it. It's actually some kind of like external force. And yeah, this can be extremely compelling. Um, junk Bond Trader, who I, I really like, uh, YouTube, uh, YouTuber who, you know, does uh, trip reports. Yeah, he recently, uh, I think, had a live stream where he was taking DMT. And uh, yeah, he experienced like really strong like simulationist uh, trips. Uh, you know, the content of his uh, trip was about being in a simulation. And, and interestingly too, one of the things that he said was that uh, his ability to explain the proof that, you know, these uh, entities gave him that he is in a simulation essentially degraded uh, as a function of him trying to explain it. So like basically every time you try to verbalize it, the very act of trying to verbalize it and communicate it with others basically erases that information. 
which yeah kind of like makes it feel very compellingly that this is a feature of the world simulation that in some sense you know part of like how this whole thing is programmed is such that you can never actually be sure that this is a simulation mm -hmm. so fun right <laughs> well to some extent i might call that a you know epistemological mishap uh that like okay if we don't live in a simulation it's actually kind of dangerous the fact that you know there's a drug that makes you feel like that uh, it's uh, as i've you know told it before um dmt might be kind of like a hand grenade for your epistemology and you know i i gave a presentation at the oxford psychedelic society uh last week uh which i, I also wrote about it in quality computing is the latest post um uh, talking about basically how beliefs change under psychedelics because you know there's this fascinating research by Robin Carhart Harris and, and Carl Friston uh, they take kind of like the, yeah the basically computational theories of consciousness uh, in particular you know models of information processing involving Markov blankets and probabilistic you know graphical models and how like with psychedelics basically you get a, a weakening of the precision of the high-level priors as a consequence. And so you basically have like bottom-up information able to propagate through the hierarchy of predictions and, uh, you know, uh, jitter it a little bit. And actually they talk about like simulated annealing as kind of like a good metaphor. Uh, now, uh, it's clear to me that, you know, like weakening beliefs is not all that happens on psychedelics you know also you get like really strong beliefs as well like you know dmt is like oh gosh like we absolutely 100 percent must be in a simulation yes that is a side effect <laughs> of dmt and it's not just the weakening of beliefs so you know some other people uh have pointed this out you know the lab of anil seth and um uh adam saffron they he wrote a and uh you know a response to to reduced uh, beliefs under psychedelics called strengthened beliefs under psychedelics, talking about how in some sense some other layers of the hierarchy might actually be excited and in some sense, you know, uh, it's not only the weakening of the high-level priors, it's also the strengthening of mid-level priors. So, so anyway, the, the picture is pretty murky and complicated, but the contribution that we were offering, you know, from the point of view of QRI is um, the implementation counterpart to this uh, model. So what uh, you know, Carl Friston and, and uh, Carhart Harris are talking about is a computational level account, whereas what we tend to focus at, on at QRI is basically the implementation level. Uh, you know, we talk about connectum specific harmonic waves, uh, we basically talk about like phase locking and mode locking between resonant modes and how that builds, you know, our world simulation. And, uh, you know, annealing has a particular uh, meaning in that model, which is basically something that takes you out of local minima of dissonance between, uh, you know, uh, harmonic modes. So basically, uh, a world simulation also contains basically this hedonic quality, which is its valence, uh, which can be in the form of consonant or, you know, classically called, you know, uh, harmonic sensations. Uh, it can also come in the form of dissonance, which is unpleasant, or noise, which is uh, neutral, neither good nor bad. And uh, the idea is that um, the way in which this predictive coding hierarchy is actually implemented physically is as a hierarchical network of resonance that, in a sense, um, implements the free energy principle in the following way, which is that you have like these models of the world, which are basically networks of resonance. And model complexity comes with an intrinsic cost, which is that, you know, the higher the model complexity, the more intrinsic dissonance it will tend to have. So as a general rule, we tend to prefer simpler models just for that reason alone. More so, more compact and symmetrical models also, uh, because uh, of the dissonance minimization, basically are preferred. Uh, so like there's also kind of these like parsimony uh, benefit. Uh, and then like, uh, prediction errors are unpleasant because when uh, adjacent layers of the hierarchy are not in coherence, basically the, their communication is out of phase, so that causes dissonance. So basically, yeah, we get the free energy principle with this model, which is that you're actually trying to maximize accuracy minus complexity. Now, I know this is a lot of concepts. <laughs> Hopefully you're bearing with me. With DMT, you know, how we apply this to DMT? Well, in our model at QRI, 
the signature of DMT essentially is competing clusters of coherence. So there are these you know, fascinating, fasc fascinating model of coupled oscillators. So basically if you have a, a network of coupled oscillators um, and uh, it, it's a geometric network, let's say like uh, it's kind of like a lattice, um, uh, usually they're not going all of them to enter into synchrony or you know, coherence. Coherence is a generalization of synchrony where basically, you know, uh, anyway, it's a little bit tricky, but basically it's, synchrony is, is, a good, uh, is a good proxy for this. So basically, if the network is geometric, meaning that it's kind of looks like a lattice, let's say, you know, um, it will be such that there's usually not going to be the possibility of global synchrony. There's going to be kind of these like traveling waves of synchrony or like patches of synchrony emerge and maybe even kind of like an evolutionary process to some extent of like, you know, patches of synchrony competing with one another. But, uh, you know, the synchronies are going to be very localized and self-contained. Now, if you start adding random connections between these oscillators, basically coupling them in that way, um, at some point there's going to be like some interesting phase change where the entire network is going to be saturated by these basically patterns of synchrony. And now the evolutionary process is going to be crazy. Basically it's an ecosystem of different patterns of resonance that are basically trying to co-opt the energy of the system. Um, and that could be its attractor and it could be a very chaotic thing. If you add more connections at some point, you know, the average, what's called the, you know, the average synaptic path length is going to be short enough that actually the entire network can enter into uh, synchrony. Um, so, uh, you know, there's kind of like two phase changes. And something that we suspect is that DMT, you know, the particular way in which it modifies the topology of the, you know, connectome and, you know, the, the way propagation dynamics is such that, you know, you get the first kind, which is that you get these competing patches of coherence. Now, 5-MeO DMT, it actually feels like all of your nervous system enters into a coherent state, um, which would be kind of the other extreme, you know, like you actually get global synchrony. Um, and, you know, that kind of like matches the phenomenology, right? Like 5-MeO DMT is this actually really, really, really simple type of a state of consciousness. Everything is aligned, you know, there's no internal boundaries. And to some extent, you know, if you are in a world simulation created by your brain, and out of phase or desynchronized, uh, you know, patches actually give rise to boundaries. When everything is actually in coherence, there's no internal boundaries. That might explain why it actually feels like everything is one. There's just no se separation whatsoever, you know? So that's kind of 5-MeO DMT, but regular quote-unquote DMT or NNDMT, um, it's an ecosystem of different like patterns of resonance. And, you know, over time, uh, as you do it more and more, you will essentially anneal, ultimately, you know, things that actually uh, are really good at surviving <laughs> in that neuronal environment. And in that sense, you're kind of like creating these resilient, almost quasi, you know, sub-agents, which, uh, yeah, I mean, like, if you do it too much, it, that actually represents a problem. You can actually start to develop, you, you know, like kind of like multiple sub personalities and really crazy, really crazy beliefs. And uh, some people even get possessed. <laughs> I'm not joking. Like there's, yeah, basically uh, anecdotes and <laughs> it does happen. Possessed, personally, you know, I think it's a sub agent, you know, one of these like clusters of coherence actually managed to gather enough resources to command, you know, motor actions and verbal responses and thought processes and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, that makes it, you know, so compelling. It's like this very high energy state of consciousness. There's all of these, like, competition for survival. Um, in, in some sense, like, the patterns that are great at surviving are those that are, in some sense, like, more emotionally shocking are things that are actually, you know, drive your attention. And this goes, it's not only, you know, low level features like colors and sensations. Uh, and it's not even only, you know, like a, a, a competition between patterns uh, at kind of like the level of like little agents or something like that, although there is a lot of that too, but also <laughs> there is a competition of patterns in the super self meta programmer. 
So, up there, you know, your super ego <laughs> is getting fragmented as well. It is like dividing and, and, you know, all these like different clusters and interpretations of reality also arise and they compete with one another. So, yeah, I mean, like your high level thoughts about reality also undergo this crazy annealing process. And yeah, I mean, the idea that we live in a simulation sometimes wins out. And, you know, in the video uh, I was referencing of Junk Bond Trader, yeah, I think like, at least in that video and maybe even later, like, yeah, that's the super self meta programmer that actually won <laughs> that, that particular, you know, um, you could say like, you know, round of combat between these uh, thought forms or patterns of resonance. Now, also the, the crazy thing here is that um, whenever you have these patches of coherence, it is not only the case that they will behave in this coherent way. And yes, I mean, actually that manifests as this, you know, crazy mode locked geometric patterns with even potentially higher virtual dimensions and hyperbolic geometry because of the way in which basically they saturate space and a network of just noticeable differences actually embeds hyperbolic uh, metric. Um, so there's all of that craziness, you know, going on. But, you know, in addition to that, <laughs> um, by creating coherence across layers of the hierarchy, you're bypassing the ability to basically resist uh, information coming from the lower layers and, you know, label it as, you know, prediction errors. So it's crazy, you know, not only because of the quality of the experience, but also because it causes forced belief updates and there's very little you can do about it. I mean, like for other things, you can take antidotes, but like, you know, the forced belief updates on DMT, why do you take? <laughs> well, personally, I think that really good philosophy and epistemology can actually protect against it. Probably also, you know, psychological robustness, being in a good mood, meditating a lot, you know, you know, thinking about these things very carefully for a long time and so on, not being in a social environment that, you know, encourages you to think about simulation theory too much and so on. All of those things are helpful and, and can be protective. But unfortunately, <laughs> you know, this forced belief updating across the layers of the hierarchy can be so powerful that, yeah, if you take a high enough dose in the right circumstances, even if you're like really rational, you may end up actually, you know, in a very embodied way, you know, your emotions aligning to the belief that, yeah, there's a very high probability that we live in a simulation of some sort. And that's why DMT is kind of an epistemological hand grenade. <laughs> the, the, the contents of the hallucination are coercive. They're freaking coercive. They, they actually, you know, really, really push you to, to, to believe it. Um, but there's also other things that, in a sense, suggest we are in a simulation that come from DMT. Uh, I also have a video called Why Does DMT Feel So Real? Uh, I wasn't talking about, you know, uh, probabilistic graphical models and like that sort of thing. But um, uh, I, I did mention a few like features of these hallucinations that, yeah, basically convince a lot of people that, you know, they're like actually referencing a mind independent reality. Uh, I mentioned basically high energy parameter. So basically the energy parameter, also, you know, the amount of consciousness, you can think of it as adding up the pixel brightness of all of the pieces of your world simulation. The reality is that there's like a lot of things that contribute to the energy of your consciousness. Um, one of them, for example, is like the brightness of colors. Another one is uh, the curvature of the space of the world sheet. Um, but yeah, also like the intensity of emotions and things like that. So basically line up all of the features of your world simulation, you know, take their temperature, take like how intense they are and add all of that up. And that is going to be your energy parameter and DMT really shoots it like, you know, up the, I don't know how to call it. Like, yeah, basically it's like a stratospheric like level of energy only outmatched by 5-MeO DMT, uh, which is, you know, obviously saying a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, basically the energy parameter is a proxy for the realness, you know, how strong and believable does it feel? Because yeah, I mean, usually, 
how our world simulation is implemented is such that uh, things that feel more strong uh, are things that we weight more heavily and we consider to be more real, right? Like, who do you love between two potential partners? He's like, oh, I, my, the love I feel more strongly for this person, this must be the true love sort of uh, reasoning. Uh, likewise, like, which of these worlds, seem, which of these uh, metaphysical interpretations is true? Oh, this one f feels stronger, feels more real, more sparkly, more present. That must be the real one. So yeah, DMT makes these metaphysical interpretations of reality feel very vivid as well. Again, it's not just, you know, the colors and the tactile sensations. It's like all of all of that, including, yeah, your, your high-level beliefs. Um, the other thing too about DMT is that it basically generates a lot of uh, multimodal coherence, uh, or we also call it, you know, um, cross-modal uh, coherence where it's not only that you experience really crazy visual hallucinations and tactile hallucinations, but they're interlocked with each other. Uh, and actually, you know, yeah, in, in psychonautic communities, they, they, they have talked about it, how like uh, one of the fascinating properties of DMT is that very bright lights actually have a corresponding embodied component. So like when you feed, they call it the central light in the uh, hyperspace lexicon, I believe, from D DMT Nexus. The central light usually is going to be something that gets interpreted as Buddha or Jesus or Krishna or the essence or logos or whatever you may call it. And uh, is not only a very bright and intensely aesthetic light, uh, it also like deeply resonates with every fiber of your being. And in that sense, yes, it's very, it feels incredibly real for that reason. Uh, now, within QRI, we have this, you know, different way of interpreting these, which is that, you know, that's a super energized state of consciousness. Usually the peak of an annealing cycle, where basically the attention field lines all converge, which is an annealing effect, you know, nothing supernatural about it, you know, um, yeah, it's kind of like the, the, the metallic lattice in a sense actually became symmetrical. So all the attention field lines concentrate. Uh, and because of the symmetry more so, uh, it's also a super high valence state of consciousness. And so it feels beautiful beyond what you can imagine normally. So again, because of the proxy that like the things that feel more emotionally intense, we tend to associate as like more real Then yeah, that's more real than real. Except that, you know, within our model, it's, you know, a state of your inner world simulation, uh, kind of like in the upper left corner of like very high energy and low information content. I mean, I personally think that that's where like a lot of the gold is of reality. Like that's actually, <laughs> uh, if there's a point uh, in reality, yeah, it's kind of that. It is like the Buddha and the Krishna type, you know, quality of consciousness that you experience on DMT without the delusions. And I think, uh, yeah, our descendants will probably experience that for breakfast, if I were to guess, <laughs> or something actually way more refined and like way more intense, more even more, more pleasurable um, than that. Um, and the other crazy thing too, is because of the competing patterns of synchrony, this also feels transpersonal. So here's the thing, the way in which we represent inter you know, boundaries between people, uh, it, it happens through internal boundaries because, you know, the, your entire world simulation is contained in your brain. Uh, so there's going to be a, a mechanism for that. And we think it's like basically being out of synchrony, uh, basically being actually implemented with different frequencies uh, or out of phase. There, there's like several methods, but just different frequencies uh, does the job. So when you simulate somebody else around you, you also simulate their biorhythms. You simulate basically vibrational qualities of, uh, of, of them. Um, and when you like somebody, there is quote unquote interpersonal resonance. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that there's like these waves of energy that go literally outside of your body and kind of like and make, you know, a kind of like etheric resonance with others. Rather, within your world simulation, there are waves of energy that get, um, that move around through flow and they can actually synchronize the internal components of the world simulation. And I would claim, I mean, this has to be verified empirically uh, with like good enough neuroimaging and adequate models. But yeah, I mean, basically I would claim that MDMA 
basically makes the internal simulation of you know the avatars of other people in your experience enter into interpersonal resonance through basically something akin to yeah basically restricting the the um, the repertoire of possible harmonic modes to just a subset of it uh, where every possible combination is actually consonant with each other um, so there's just basically no way of <laughs> playing out of key so to speak uh, whereas yeah I mean if you represent somebody you don't like or somebody who upsets you for whatever reason your internal representation of that person will be out of key relative to everything else that's happening in your world simulation that also happens with ideas not only people whenever there's an idea that threatens your worldview you know it may you know um kind of like hit load-bearing beliefs uh, in your worldview you will uh assess it as basically having the potential for being destructive and, and causing dissonance and uh, this is a yeah an insight from uh, mike johnson that you know this kind of it involves a, a projective geometry where like we're really good at like anticipating like okay if we were to take that idea seriously how would it unfold and how would it actually change our world simulation now i should ask for forgiveness to some extent because uh i've actually used pretty strong language recently when i was <laughs> talking about how understanding neural annealing and how it impacts belief updates is an antidote against psychedelic brainwashing i mean it's true but yeah i know you know telling somebody that their most you know prized and cherished you know peak experience was actually a kind of psychedelic brainwashing rather than like you know literally meeting source or something like that yeah that must be pretty unpleasant uh so <laughs> apologies about that but you took the red pill come on <laughs> i didn't make you take the red pill <laughs> you did <laughs> well i took the red pill too um Okay, so what else? Uh, on DMT, people also come back and say things such as, it's all digital. It's all digital. Like, you don't believe it, but it felt so digital. Okay, so one explanation here is the reason why our world simulation doesn't look so digital usually, uh, you know, kind of like a, an old Pixar movie with like all of these gloss and so on, it's because it's grainy. It has kind of like some noise do it and neurologically you know it, it might actually be something like alpha rhythms <laughs> that is actually uh you know carrying priors and expectations and if you look at what dmt does uh with uh eeg it massively drops alpha rhythms it's kind of like within the the period of like seven minutes or so that is like really affecting you and especially at the peak the alpha band goes silent isn't that crazy so, yeah, I mean, if it goes silent, it will make everything look very crisp. Very, very, very crisp. Not grainy at all. So, all of a sudden, you get this feeling of like, oh my gosh, there's so much information content. It cannot be, you know, something I'm imagining because my imagination is not that detailed. Well, yeah, the graininess was kind of an artifact of the alpha rhythm or something of that sort. Well, I, I would claim. Uh, that also, with the symmetry theory of valence, explains the uh, valence effects here because with a in intensified crispness you know with, without the the noise kind of like softening component everything is going to either sound very crisply dissonant or very crisply consonant so basically the elements of your world simulation will be vibrating at a very high frequency slightly different frequency one from an one another um, there, there's going to be a dual relationship between the shapes of what is going on of the of those uh, phenomenal objects and their vibrational modes and whether they're compatible or not will basically make the experience pleasant or unpleasant um, a lot of people say i don't care about the visuals you know the science about the visuals of dmt or whatnot like you know who cares i care about the emotional processing or the, or the spiritual connection well here's one thing i actually postulate there is a duality between the emotional processing and actually the contents of the world simulation um yeah very much including the visual component too again remember the you know cross moral coherence in on dmt your visual field actually becomes you know harmonically locked with everything else in your world simulation so 
it's almost kind of like turning your visual field into a valence machine. It could go very, be very pleasant or very unpleasant. You know, the patterns literally hurt or they literally feel blissful because not only intrinsically within the visual cortex that would be the case, but also because they are kind of like tuning knobs. They're like levers for the consonants or dissonance in the rest of your world simulation. <laughs> so yeah, and I mean, once you know this and you pay attention to it, you will see it everywhere. I mean, you will see how every de you know detail of the experience on DMT has a corresponding valence quality and how you can, in some sense, improve the valence of the state by taking care of the geometry of the state and vice versa. You can modify the geometry by doing, you know, meditation exercises that put you in a particular mood. Now, again, the, the N size of this is not super large, you know, this, but, <laughs> uh, and I know these are like pretty bold predictions, but you know, we've, we've been, we've been right in the past about some things. Um, and, uh, I would bet on these, <laughs> uh, that yeah, we do basically uh, a large study of uh, very detailed phenomenology rather than, you know, the traditional type of questionnaires, uh, altered states questionnaires and so on, which are low dimensional information filters from, you know, the actual stuff that goes on a psychedelic. Uh, yeah, we interview people who just came back from a trip and we ask them about their mood and basically their experience. They will say something along the lines of, you know, if they had a bad trip, they probably were experiencing also these very jagged curves and very sharp edges and they were like maybe pinching against one another and rubbing and there was friction involved and resistance and you know heating of the substrate and a whole bunch of bad stuff happening at the level of the dissonance of the configuration of the of the experience whereas yeah somebody who just went to one of the heaven realms of DMT will say oh my gosh there was this fluid light that was kind of bouncing around the walls and it was all so harmonious and and smooth and and uh, and skillful how this energy was being managed in such a way that it didn't interfere with itself in order to prevent its own um, involvement in the creation of yeah basically unpleasant qualities of experience so even though nominally you know you're computing metaphysics you're you're trying to figure out you know the the nature of reality uh, by actually using, you know, the, the, in, the unique quality computing properties of the state, um, you are doing so by trying to climb the valence gradients. So you're not actually, in a sense, <laughs> in any way, escaping the biggest simulation, which is the fact that what we do is for the purpose of increasing our valence. <laughs> yeah, so that still happens on DMT. You know, a lot of people say, like, no, you know, pleasure is very superficial or avoiding pain is very superficial. You know, on DMT or on a meditation, you know, I can avoid all of that. Well, actually, developing the ability to disengage with, you know, compulsively pursuing pleasure allows you to, in a sense, experience even higher qualities of, ple of pleasure. I mean, you know, Shenzhen Young talks about, um, yeah, how like you can experience like very high, highly pleasant uh, you know, uh, sensory um, inputs with equanimity that can be tremendously healing and is also even better. So, yes, anyway, the highest, you know, DMT heavens, not only are they super consonant and very high energy, they're also full of equanimity. Basically, it's very crazy that, like, having the mindset of I could take it or leave it actually gives rise to way better experiences. But again, He's still pursuing valence. It's just kind of this crazy hack about like the, the human brain that like pursuing valence explicitly kind of feels bad. And I know that, okay, thinking about this might actually feel bad for a little bit. Eventually we'll get used to it and uh, kind of like start understanding the world in a slightly different way. Again, you took the red peel. <laughs> you took the red peel. <laughs> okay, so what else? Um, the content itself, there's, there's something really crazy about DMT experiences that makes it, uh, makes the simulation, uh, you know, theory very believable, which is things such as like going to another dimension where you see that all of your life was kind of like a little program um, and you literally see like kind of like the consoles of, you know, it's not going to be Xbox or whatever is going to be like, you know, 
5D super mega multiverse uh, <laughs> kind of like mixture between yeah Tumblr and Steam and YouTube you know super high um, uh, state space explorer uh, you know trademark sort of thing and that there's like many of those and like you know these realities just maybe kind of like a tiny program in there okay like why the hell does that happen well first the concept of the simulation in a cells in a sense like allows your subconscious to um in some way order all of this massive amount of information into some kind of semantically meaningful world simulation and the reason that is important is that organizing all of this qualia into a coherent narrative also is a way to minimize dissonance i mean we are programmed specifically in, in such a way that uh, the things that don't make sense feel unpleasant. We don't like state of confusion. So, uh, and on DMT, basically, you see, you know, predictive coding principles happening in real life, which is that, you know, uh, not in real life, it always happens in real life, but happening in real time, you know, the hallucinations that like, if you don't recognize anything in that, you know, crazy trip, um, it will be extremely fluid and all undefined and very high energy. But if you kind of like take a few of the features of like the crazy jumbled up, you know, colorful hallucination that you have, that is maybe very spacious at first, as you identify a feature in it, the, what we call the world sheet, which is basically this phenomenal, expanded phenomenal space, will crystallize around the things that you can recognize. So... You know, that's why actually the intensity of the effects kind of like go, grows exponentially to some extent, because as you increase the dose, um, the things that you can basically re rearrange that world sheet as become less and less familiar. Like, you know, when you take it as small dose, uh, a lot of things can be familiar. You can, you know, organize uh, the contents of your world sheet as, for example, kind of these spherical geometries uh, uh, and yeah I mean like if you take I don't know like 10 gram 10 milligrams of DMT or something like that yeah you'll see a bunch of uh, stuff like that yeah I think I'm uh, the DXM I feel a little bit of the DX anyway threshold does nothing too interesting but uh, uh, anyway so uh, but yeah in higher amounts you will see things like these and you know even slightly higher amounts you will see things like these and of course you know, you can say something like, well, I don't have any many imagination that allows me to actually, you know, picture something like this. So like the fact that I was seeing it with such clarity, you know, and usually it's, you know, rotating and shifting and, you know, morphing and, and so on. But uh, yeah, usually they're, they're like perfectly tiled. Like that's, that's an important, you know, hint. Well, um, the harmonic resonance uh, model of neurocomputation uh, kind of explains that. You know, because everything in your world simulation is already implemented with harmonics. It's just that like a Fourier transform, you use higher harmonics in order to cancel out the repeating patterns in, you know, big objects. So that's why, um, you know, naturally, just with the low, low frequency harmonics, you would get kind of these artifacts. But uh, yeah, you know, on DMT, because of the scrambling of the... Uh, mode locking of the harmonics one of the things that happens is that the you know big outlined objects like these um, they won't have the higher frequency harmonics perfectly tuned in order to cancel out this type of detail so in some sense you're actually seeing um, something simpler I mean it is higher energy and it looks really complicated but in some sense it actually it's kind of like the basic, it's like the basic shape, the basic resonant modes um, up on which, you know, you, you, you add up uh, stuff in order to cancel out those, those details. Um, yeah, you know, in, in higher doses, you experience like, you know, hyperbolic honeycomb type things. The thing is that um, the higher the energy, the more uh, unusual the objects are. So the less you actually have an ability to crystallize the world sheet into them. Um, so as the temperature parameter increases, 
uh, it, it really gets to a point where you really don't know anything <laughs> that could feed that much energy. Like really, just... And that's why, uh, yeah, breakthrough type experiences, um, they really don't make sense. I mean, they're like so all over the place, these crazy ontologies. Now, narrative is one of the possible what we call Bayesian energy sinks. So if you have a high-level narrative that organizes all of this energy, that is going to be preferred from a valence point of view, because then the flows are not going to be interfering with each other and the experience being dissonant as a consequence. So, um, yeah, I think like that explains... So, but the thing is, like, if, if you're exposed to other philosophies, you will basically crystallize the world sheet in very different ways. And even just watching this video might actually change your DMT trips. The thing is, like, yeah, people who are very into this, you know, simulation stuff, they often consume even more media about it. So, you know, you're kind of, like, generating these uh, conditioned patterns in your subconscious, and then you're encountering those illuminated in your DMT trip, and yes, of course, it kind of, you know, is validating of those patterns. But anyway, uh, I do think that it is possible to remain sane despite, you know, being exposed to these exotic states of consciousness, and despite the forced belief updates and so on, if you know that that is what is going on. I think that is important, that will prevent some level of, uh, you know, implicit <laughs> low-level psychosis. Um, importantly, because these are uh, uh, competing patterns of coherence, uh, in some sense they are literally unsettling. Like, they basically knock you out of your normal low-energy resonant attractors. And yeah, I mean, if um, you see somebody who just came out of a DMT trip, they will usually be very overexcited. There's a lot of like thought forms that they are not really integrating. Uh, these resonant modes are kind of like sting still going, even after several hours. And, um, you know, it, it, it take, takes a while to actually lower the energy of those kind of uh, remnants. And um, if you do it too much, that accumulates. And it accumulates hard over time. So like if you're, you know, doing DMT every day, uh, maybe even several times a day. Um, I, I think at some point, yeah, basically the evolutionary process of these patterns of coherence is just so strong that, yeah, you know, your normal everyday ego just has no fighting chance. I mean, maybe one in a million persons. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I do think in the long run, just taking too much DMT without pauses or without like something to reset you, uh, yeah, will kind of like lead to this implicit psychosis. Um, uh, I, I will also say, though, that uh, I made a video about uh, zero ontology. Um, and I think that, uh, which is an explanation for why there is something rather than nothing. I think like one of the things that the simulation, one of the reasons why the simulation hypothesis is so appealing um, in these states of consciousness is that they, they don't, you know, give you much of, they don't give you much of an explanation for why there's something rather than nothing. But also, if you believe that that is impossible to answer, you might as well say that, okay, maybe reality is actually more complex than this, and this is just kind of like a, a special case of it. Um, but if you do have an explanation for why there is something rather than nothing, and is the sort of explanation that doesn't require intentional content for its verification, sorry, this is uh, kind of a tricky idea, but basically... Uh, if it's something that you can experience directly, not by virtue of what it means, but by virtue of how it feels, then actually your credence on the simulation hypothesis goes significantly down. Because you can see how is it possible that this universe in particular exists out of nothing. And then, you know, yeah, kind of like an elaborate, kind of like additional set of layers and so on. Yeah, it's not so appealing because you can see how this could actually be basement reality and i think like zero ontology is like that because you know one of the things it, it will uh, claim is that you know the state space of color uh basically all of these um uh what's called a clf space but basically um all of the colors um organized in a color wheel can collapse into a feeling of nothingness or sometimes and you know this absolutely happens on, on, on psychedelics and so on is that 
uh, you may experience kind of like a rainbow, uh, kind of these rainbow consciousness or phenomenal space. It looks like diffracted. It's pretty crazy. Um, all colors. And then you project it. You do a projective transformation such that you see all the colors superimposed and they cancel out. And the same thing happens for like other, you know, qualia from other sensory modalities. And also for things such as like, you know, feelings and, and thoughts, like they, they have kind of like their negatives in, in a way. And if you put them together, <laughs> they actually cancel out fully. Um, and 5-MeO DMT shows these very strongly. Now, 5-MeO DMT causes, you know, this like global super, super coherent attractor or state of consciousness. Uh, so very quickly, actually, all of the, you know, particular qualia values cancel out and you go to kind of this like emptiness or void. Um, but if you take a small dose or also if you take it a small dose, you know, while you're in a different psychedelic or something like that, um, you can see a lot this kind of like crazy rainbow effect where you see like the various, you know, qualia varieties canceling out and so on. And, you know, that is compatible with, uh, the, the, you know, zero ontology, um, I think uh, there's a case that can be made that because you can, in that way, actually fathom, you know, from a first-person point of view, why there is something rather than nothing, then, yeah, a simulation is pretty superfluous. You know, you can just actually go with quantum mechanics, and like that's, <laughs> that's good enough of an explanation. Um, anyway, so that's a, kind of like an escape hatch uh, if you're, like, too, too stuck in, a, yeah, simulation theory. Um... One last thing, though, is that there are, like, important psychological biases. Like, why something like the simulation hypothesis, simulation, you know, uh, hypothesis would be so appealing. So one of the things that can happen on DMT, for example, is that you can f you feel like you won the, you know, cosmic lottery. I I've heard this from many people. Like, honestly, <laughs> I've received emails from people who are, you know, uh, clearly they've been doing too much DMT and like oftentimes it, it, you know it comes with this kind of like story of like yeah you know like a one like a you know this is the only time this is going to happen in this reality and it, it's you know it happened to me and of course like you know if, if this happens to a lot of people and they all say it's like them <laughs> in particular yeah it's similar to kind of like when people say that they are Jesus and of course within open individualism yes we're all Jesus in a fundamental sense but also on a relative sense we definitely are not and I think there's very you know you can make the case that like on a relative sense yeah definitely all these people are not actually winning the cosmic lottery rather you know there's kind of this crazy annealing effect where everything converges in one point again the central light very high valence very very strong feeling of being special or being chosen because yeah i mean everything is converging towards you in your world simulation <laughs> um and uh yeah i mean so that can cause a super strong impression and feeling special is basically one of the things that we crave the most i mean like it's part of our programming and it's like very deeply seated evolutionarily and um it have it, you know it influences reality or world simulation in subtle ways uh constantly um and um feeling that you have kind of the cheat code to reality and everybody else is kind of a you know sheep you know just eating it up eating it all up just you know actually buying into you know this cardboard simulation sort of thing yes of course it makes you feel very special of course and yeah i mean like i think like when your imaging actually becomes good enough and we can find, okay, this is the feeling special, you know, part of the brain or, you know, kind of like tuning knobs for the, that quality of the simulation. Yeah, um, I bet that people experiencing psychedelic mania, that's like just very brightly lit. And that if you're able to kind of uh, inhibit it directly, yeah, it's going to go down and like all of a sudden they might, you know, still have like some psychotic effects but they're not going to feel you know special <laughs> now a lot of our feelings does come from that and like the feeling of status and so on and uh in practice you you know you can very much uh become super depressed if you know that it gets damaged it's very difficult to just be a monk who doesn't care about what other people think about you and so on so yeah i mean in practice it's important not to mess with that and uh yeah something like dmt can mess with that like big time like 
super, you know, like giving you like powerful orgasms of like feeling like the most special person in in all of existence, this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, that can't be good for your epistemology, right? It's, <laughs> it's not going to give rise to a very accurate, you know, model of reality. Uh, but that part of the brain or that quality of our, our human experience um, matters a lot for understanding social reality, you know, and Actually, I would say that one of the most interesting ways in which we actually do live in a world simulation, and again, apologies, you took the red pill, maybe this is going to be the double red pill, or the, you know, not even, yeah, I don't know, the, the, the 3000 degrees Celsius, you know, red pill, so you can also just pause the video now, but the, the, the uh, you know, if I were to swallow this whole thing, um, sort of thing, so... Uh, are you sure? All right, if, if you're sure, then yes, proceed. Okay, so uh, the, a very non-trivial and interesting way in which, yes, we actually do live in a, in, in a simulation in addition to being in a world simulation is uh, the simulations that we create for each other. Uh, there's this book, uh, one of the most depressive books, um, you know, I know. Um, and uh, Sarah Perry... Um, uh, she has like a lot of fascinating essays in the Ribbon Farm and in other parts of the internet. But yeah, I mean, basically, she talks about how um, so much of what we do in life is actually to create the impression that kind of like the world has meaning and like the, the simulation actually uh, makes sense. And um, that rather than talking about kind of like the, the experience machine, uh, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, the experience machine... Uh, thought experiment it's uh like i would never go into you know an experience machine i care about authenticity and so on uh, well she would say that actually the feeling of authenticity is also a parameter of the simulation so uh when we choose authenticity is not very different from actually choosing you know like just the most the more pleasant stuff <laughs> uh even if it's like full of illusions because authenticity too is a sort of illusion is a socially concoct concocted illusion um and uh and we eat it up like big time right like our culture like you know so many simulations within simulations in social reality um and as it turns out it prevents us from seeing reality as it is which is a collection of experiences most of which are not necessarily having that much of a great time and really like heaven and hell are real their states of consciousness and a lot of the social reality simulations that we play with uh, are unaware of these and they tend to have kind of like super rosy uh, picture uh, pictures of these. Um, now, I'm not strictly speaking a negative utilitarian. I don't advocate that we should destroy everything or turn the you know realities off button. Uh, the, to some extent, because I don't actually think that um, that does any good to advocate that uh, people just become depressed or worse, you know, nihilistic and you know, antisocial or withdrawn or something like that. Um, actually, if you want to influence reality in a very positive way, you need to ally with people who are life lovers because life lovers will inherit the earth, <laughs> like it or not. Um, and I do value actually like positive states of consciousness. I I do con consider them very valuable, but I'm also very cognizant the extent to which we deceive ourselves about how bad some other states of consciousness are. And um, if you actually want to take the red pill, it will entail taking a very close look at things such as experiential hell. Now, do it in a way that doesn't hurt you, that doesn't destroy your soul, so to speak, uh, you know, put a lot of protection around you. And if you feel your, you know, your protective suit, you know, developing cracks, you should go back to the surface and, uh, and replenish and become healthy and happy and wholesome again before you go on to try to save more souls from hell, so to speak. Um, but still, I think the ultimate red pill is to recognize that hell is real and that it's currently alive. And we, yeah, if we are any good, we should just actually get rid of it. And by that, I mean things such as 
uh, yeah, negative extremes like kidney stones and cluster headaches and stuff like that, which uh, is not fun to think about, but it is, in some sense, the final frontier for the dedicated altruist who is not buying into the stupid simulations that her brain creates to distract us from reality. Okay, anyway, uh, <laughs> apologies for all of that. Uh, again, you took the red pill. Um, so I will conclude with uh, something uh, pretty cool, which is that, you know, a lot of what we experience is illusion, all the way from kind of the continuity of the self to basically our traditional sources of meaning and even the non-traditional sources of meaning <laughs> that we generate for ourselves. But there's an aspect of our world's simulation that actually doesn't get more real than it is, which is its hedonic tone or its valence. Basically, that is the one part of experience whose meaning is intrinsic. It's not something that you decide because of, you know, how it affects the rest of the experience or how it fits with the rest of the experience. Nothing like that, which actually, you know, from the point of view of our post-human descendants will probably be like brick a brack. I think David Pierce <laughs> mentioned it that way. But yeah, basically, um, colors and textures and so on, they're going to be irrelevant from their point of view. Because actually where the juice is, is in, in valence. Like that's the one thing that is intrinsically meaningful. So ultimately the illusions that we do inhabit are real because they modulate our valence. And in that sense, yeah, they, they really truly, truly embody truth. It's just that their explicit causal models don't match the network of experience that make up reality. But we can actually do something that does that, uh, I believe. Um, and we're working towards it. So with that, <laughs> as always, <laughs> hell must be destroyed. And see you in heaven on earth when we make it happen. Infinite bliss. Ciao.